Good morning, and, uh, or good afternoon or good evening whenever you encounter this. Grateful to be joining you here on a Sunday morning via a Thursday morning in light of last Sunday's technical difficulties. But that's okay. Grateful to have you with us and trust that this message will find its way to your heart. Uh, as w- Of course, we pray that every Sunday here at Cornerstone, that whatever the message from God's Word is will find its way all the way to not just our head but our hearts. And uh, this morning, or this afternoon, or this evening, today, as, uh, as I share this, it's the final message in a series of three uh, called These Three Remain from 1 Corinthians 13, 13. I'm going to read the entire chapter in just a second. And this, this day's message is called The Greatest is Love. That's how the chapter actually ends. But listen to these words from God's Word, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. It tells us what love is, what love isn't, what love does, what love doesn't do. And uh, reminds us again at the very end that it's the greatest uh, of all. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I felt like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And that's the title of the message, The Greatest is Love. One of the most beautiful and brutal statements I've ever heard concerning love comes from C.S. Lewis. It's from a book he wrote called The Four Loves, based on the four words in the Bible that are translated the singular word love in English. Uh, eros is romantic or, or, or erotic love. Storge or storge, family love. Philia, brotherly love. Philadelphia, that city in Pennsylvania, the city of brotherly love. And agape, which is God's love. Agape is the word from John 3.16, for God so agape, God so loved the world. It's a love that's initiated by the one doing the loving that, that is not contingent upon the object of its love in the sense of its power and beauty and ability to transform. But they're all, tra- again, all four of those words, eros, storge, philia, and agape, uh, are translated into the one word, love, in English. And the quote from C.S. Lewis is this. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. That's a brutal and beautiful statement. I've often heard people say of it, and I have, give your heart to anything, even a dog, and it'll be broken. But uh, would rather love hard and love well and then really hurt if that, when that love and the ability to give and receive it comes to an end than to never have loved at all. So as we come to the end of this series called These Three Remain, I trust we will be encouraged and strengthened by love himself Remember we talked about that uh, with hope, too. Hope is both a noun and a verb. Love is a noun and a verb. Faith is, is uh, just a noun. 
Not that it's just a noun as though it's not significant. But, um, and again, it's in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, after the whole chapter speaks of love, that Paul then makes this observation, and he elevates faith and hope with love, like the ultimate uh, uh, trio, as it were. Faith, hope, and love, but with love being the greatest. That Those three remain. So my prayer has been and will continue to be that faith, hope, and love will define and shape us in ways that they haven't yet. And as a result of this expanded focus on, on three, that our lives will make a bigger difference. May today's message on the one that's the greatest of them all, which is love, do justice to the beauty and wonder of that love. And so uh, I wanted to share the words of a, of a great old hymn called The Love of God, written by Frederick Lehman. And it says it so well. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. And the chorus says, O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. And the second and third verse say this. When ancient time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong, redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints' An angel's song. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. That's such, such a beautiful verse. It's my favorite for what's that for what that is worth, but it's so it so beautifully paints this picture. If, if the oceans were filled with ink and everybody was a writer of words, we would drain those oceans, and the and the sky couldn't contain all the words and all the attempts to communicate. The love is the greatest, and then it's a call to embrace the grace to elevate them always with love being first. Here's the focus. Many of us were around years ago when a youth group at a Methodist church somewhere in Michigan decided uh, that a wristband saying WWJD would be a good reminder to wear of a really great question to ask whenever there's any doubt about what to do in any situation, anytime, anywhere. Of course, that question is, what would Jesus do? Recently, I've come across another wristband that's gaining traction meant to be worn with that WWJD wristband or to make that into one wristband with these letters HWLF which stands for he would love first and that's what today's message is all about what would Jesus do he would love first because that's what he did and that's what we should do the greatest is and always will be love love that is as God defines and describes it it requires the accompanying and contextualizing presence of his grace and truth that his love can be and should be experienced and expressed. And that all always is, is in the context of, of love that is accompanied by grace and truth in the sense of communicating and displaying that, uh, that love of God. So when it comes to love, here, here are the, the, the first point this morning is this. Love, it is the greatest of the three that remain. Just restating the obvious because sometimes the obvious gets overlooked. So again, 1 Corinthians 13, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And so the first point affirms that. Love is the greatest of the three that remain. All three are very, very important. All three are, are uh, from the heart of God for us here on earth. Uh, all three remain, uh, but love is the greatest. And under the first point, it says, since God puts love above faith and hope, so must we. Uh, the outline here is, is uh, under the post that was uh, 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 put up on Sunday morning. So you can find the outline to the message I'm sharing right now there under that first, I think in the first comment 
under the message, uh, the post from Sunday morning here on Cornerstone's Facebook page. So, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. The greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love remain. And so remember, this is really important. Co- context is a big part of you know, the phrase that's used in Scripture, rightly dividing the word of truth, letting it speak to us instead of us telling it what to say, and letting whatever it says to us be received with a heart and the intent that God originally meant. And so that requires uh, understanding the context. And when it comes to 1 Corinthians 13, um, it, it, the, the, the context of it is of course chapters 12 and 14 on either side of it where paul begins a teaching on telling us i don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual gifts at the beginning of of uh, first corinthians 12 and he describes the gifts and their expression and then uh, inserted into this is the the uh, 13th chapter that actually begins with these words and yet i will show you a more excellent way Uh, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels. So actually the transition is there, and yet I will show you a more excellent way, even better, even greater than these amazing gifts of the Spirit that God gives is the love of God. And then he ends by inserting faith and hope and elevating them in the life of of a believer. And then in verse 14, he, he goes back to the spiritual gifts. Verse 14 says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. He goes back to prophecy after transitioning into and away from the focus on love. And then he speaks about prophecy, it has extensive uh, teaching on speaking in tongues. So 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 13, the ultimate expression of the fruit of the Spirit, love. Um, kind of like a sandwich, gifts, f- the fruit and uh, the gifts. Uh, and, and then understanding that the context is that uh, primarily. And then it's important to uh, acknowledge that uh, love is the key to everything functioning as it should. That's part of what's happening. Even the gifts of the Spirit function as they should only if love is the preset, if love is already in place, the love that God intends. And so how timely uh, to come across this great quote from a fellow pastor named Rich Velatis, uh, whom I'm coming to love more and more for his insights and ability to articulate important truths. Rich Velatis, find him on Instagram, uh, Facebook. He's a pastor in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, There's another great church in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Uh, New Life Fellowship, uh, Rich Velatis, and uh, just released a book on the on uh, the spirit formed life or the spiritually formed life. He's writing another one. He's just really, really great brother. And what he what I came across really resonates in my heart because it's important to acknowledge though First Corinthians thirteen is almost always read at weddings. It, it, it marriage isn't mentioned within a mile of the of the chapter. Uh, so here's what Rich wrote. 1 Corinthians 13 was not written with a wedding ceremony in mind. (laughs) That's important to remember. That's great exegesis and contextualization. This isn't about marriage. It's about love, which is the key to marriage. But it's not specifically about marriage. It's about life. Um, It's meant to give us, it's, it's not meant to give us warm, fuzzy feelings. This chapter is Paul's word of rebuke to a church marked by great miracles and charisma, but by little maturity and character. And again, indeed, men, marriage isn't mentioned in it or around it in, in, any, in any way. 1 Corinthians 13, the truth in it, is meant for life every day in every way, not just to be read at weddings. And so then another great song slash hymn uh, that I want to reference, because again, when, when someone takes the time to craft lyrics or, and, and write the song, um, lyrics are... are uh, are just condensed truth in a creative and compelling and, and connecting way. And this song by uh, a, a brother named Pierce Pettis, I'm not sure if I already said his name, it's called That Kind of Love. And it's, uh, he released uh, his version of it, but Mike Card on his latest CD on, on Hesed, um, all about the love of God, uh, sings this song. I think it's the only song Mike's ever recorded that somebody else wrote all by themselves. I think Mike collaborated or at least collaborated or totally wrote every song he's ever recorded except for this one and and the hymns album that he did. But this song by Pierce Pettis, um, I hope this grabs you 
and really gets a hold of you. <coughs> Excuse me. Here are the lyrics to that kind of love. Can't be bought or sold or faked. That kind of love. It always gives itself away. That kind of love. It's wiser than the wisest sage. Its innocence makes me ashamed till I'm not sure that I can claim that kind of love. Pride and hatred cannot stand that kind of love, and greater love hath no man than that kind of love. It won't be kept unto itself. It spreads its charm. It casts its spell till no one's safe this side of hell. That kind of love. Love rejected and ignored, held in chains behind closed doors, stuff of legend and of songs, and deep down everybody longs for that kind of love. Oh, that kind of love. Some people never know that kind of love, though it only takes a child to show that kind of love. Widows smile and strong men weep, and little ones play at its feet. The deaf can hear and the blind can see that kind of love. Love triumphant, love on fire, love that humbles and inspires, love that does not hesitate with no conditions and no restraints. That kind of love, oh, that kind of love. So how could anyone deny that kind of love, knowing every heart is measured by that kind of love? Even stars fall from the sky, and everything will fall in time, except those things that cannot die. That kind of love. Oh, may we be remembered by that kind of love. What kind of love is that? The love that God defines and displays. The love that God showed in sending his son, washing the disciples' feet, taking that last step to the cross to be nailed to the cross, to die on the cross. That kind of love self-sacrificing and obviously world-changing because it's life-giving from God, that kind of love. Perhaps one of the greatest affirmations of this is found in the truth of 1 John. Um, we won't read this entire passage, but 1 John uh, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Um, it's the fourth book from the book of Revelation. First John, Second John, Third John, Jude, and then the book of Revelation. And here in First John chapter four, uh, I, I just want to highlight uh, the, the 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 two verses, uh, verses eight and sixteen. I encourage you to read the whole passage. But First John chapter four, verses seven through twenty-one. Where, where Paul be, or John begins with the admonition, "Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God." This is the John, who, uh, in his gospel account, talks about the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's speaking about himself, but he's not saying me. The disciple whom Jesus loved. This is the John who put his head on Jesus' chest on the upper at the, in the upper room. Nothing weird or wrong about that. It was an, it's just a. a, 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 a an, an intense and genuine and sincere expression of love over in that culture. I remember a dear friend of mine from Israel, uh, the men kissing on the cheek. Here in the United States, a lot of Italians and other nationalities do that. They demonstrate their love. They touch, and it's, and it's totally appropriate. And this is the John who, you know, probably heard Jesus' heartbeat less than 24 hours before it would stop there in the upper room. So he knew who he was talking about. He knew what he was talking about. He knew he was loved by God. I hope you and I know that too. And so uh, I just want to highlight, yeah, these uh, the two verses that say the exact same thing to make this point. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16. Here's verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And then in uh, verse 13, did I say? 16, in verse 16, we read these words. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. There's a verse to ponder. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. And then John repeats himself with these three words in English. God is love. Steve Green did a, a kid's uh, scripture song series of CDs several years ago when his kids were little kids. That was a while ago. And... Uh, 
in, uh, on this one that uh, highlights this verse. Um, it, it just says G-O-D is L-O-V-E. It's a great way to remember it. G-O-D is L-O-V-E, that God is love. And then to restate the obvious again, to drill in even deeper, it doesn't say that God is faith or hope. 1 Corinthians 13 ends with those three, faith, hope, and love. These three remain. But it, again, to, to make it clear, this does not say God is faith or God is hope. It says God is love. That's who God is at the core of his being. God is love. And so, again, the first point, when it comes to love, it's the greatest of the three that remain. And then uh, second and last, uh, back to verse 8 in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, we find these words. Of course, verse 8 follows verses 1 through 7, where, again, uh, the Apostle Paul is making the case for not just the presence of love, of love but the importance of love. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, the beginning of it, says, says this. Uh, and even as I read it, 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 it jumped out in my heart as I was reading it at the beginning here. Um, if we get 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 8, to the very beginning of it, the first three words. Love never fails. Before that, he, sa it's, he says, love always protect, protects, love always trusts. Trusts, love always hopes, it always perseveres, it always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. And then the beginning of verse 8 says, love never fails. You fail, I fail, all kinds of things fail. But love doesn't, not ever, not at all. And so, um, under the second point, it says, our experience with their expression of love may falter or fail, but love never fails. So, and I can almost hear the Spirit speaking uh, and asking with no, you know, no, uh, no condescending or, or, or judging or diminishing or anything concerning us and our being. But there is a sense where I can just about hear the Holy Spirit say or ask the question, the proverbial question. What part of never don't we get? Love never fails. There's nothing that's going to cause it to fail. There's no thing. There's no one. There's no scenario. There's no nothing that's ever going to cause love to fail because love never fails. Any situation, any context, any person, anything, love never fails. Of course, since the Spirit doesn't ask it in condemning or judgmental ways, but in loving and helpful ones, I hope that's how it is. We, we just need to wrestle with this. What part of love never fails don't we get? Never fails. Never, ever, 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 ever. Never say never doesn't work here. You always people say never say never, and that's only connected to things that can change or might change. Uh, the great theologian Justin Bieber said that, I think. I'm kidding about him being a the theologian. But never say never doesn't work here. Never means never. So always say never instead of never say never when it comes to 1 Corinthians 13.8. So think about that. Eventually everyone, including yourself, will fail you. Most everything will at least in some way let you down if not fail you. But love, the agape love of God, will never fail. It may allow things that from our point of view are anything but a loving thing. But if it's love, just you wait. It's never going to fail. Never, no, never. Matthew Ward's a guy I got to know when I was living in Texas back in 1984 and 85. Uh, he lived next to the property where I was staying. Uh, and the, the, uh, he, he wrote a song called Love. And one of the lines in the song says this, that uh, God's love ha can, make a, can make the strongest man cower and the weakest man tower. God's love has an impact. God's love affects the person who receives it. And again, it can make the, the, the strongest man in the sense of his own strength, his own gifts, his own abilities. God's love can, can cause that, that man or that woman or that boy or that girl to just melt in the awareness that this isn't, what I have is never enough for what is ultimately really needed in and of myself. 
but the love of God can turn a, a weak person into, a, into the strongest of, of persons in the sense of conviction and commitment and the experiencing and the expressing of this love that can't, as, as the, 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 the words from the song that Pierce Pettis, Pettis wrote, all, all but says that this kind of love is you know, indestructible, undeniable. It can be mocked, it can be ridiculed, it can be attacked, it can be attempted to be torn down, but it just never fails. And it remains, and it's the greatest. And that's what we're talking about, God's love. It's so powerful, it's so beautiful, it's so real. It can bring a nation to its knees, it can heal broken bodies and knit together healthy homes. It just can't be stopped. And then we'll end with these three passages uh, from the from the uh, first from the book of Psalms, Psalm ninety-eight, and then uh, in John three sixteen and seventeen twenty through sixteen. Back to the Gospel of John. But in Psalm, uh, yes, yeah, Psalm ninety-eight and verses two through three, we read these words, and uh, may they. Uh, pierce and, and penetrate and uh, bless and strengthen your heart. Psalm 98, verses 2 and 3. I'll start with the first verse because it speaks about something that really is a, a, a I guess, kind of helps open our hearts to being receptive to God and all that he is and all that he has for us. Sing to the Lord a new song, Psalm 98, verse 1. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of God. And the ultimate expression of the love of God is to bring salvation to the recipient of that one being loved by him who receives his love. He's come to save us. He's come to set us free. He's come to bring us out of death into life, from darkness into light, from lies into truth, from the power of Satan to the power of God. And it's love. He's remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of God. Very much, not just connected to, but flowing from his, his amazing love. And then John three sixteen. many of you know it, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. You know, we have, we have just one son. And if we, if we had more than one son, I, I'm sure. But I know for the one son we have, I, I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I'm pretty sure I couldn't just give him away so somebody else could live. Offer him and have him experience death so that somebody else could live. But God did that in sending his son so that the whole world might be saved. That's what verse 17 says. Again, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that whoever believes in him, anyone who believes in him, not just that he existed, not just that he was God, but believes in him to be who he came to be and do what he came to do and give what he came to give to save, to, to, to redeem, to set free. It's about a relationship with God through Jesus, not just an awareness of God about Jesus. And um, for who, so whoever believes will never perish but have everlasting life. That God will give that gift of eternal life to the one who believes. And then verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. All of that flowing from his love for you and me. Uh, it's amazing love. And then the, the, the last uh, passage in uh, John 17, turn there with me and we'll end with this. John chapter 17. And the, the, uh, the beauty of this, um, just amazing. John chapter 10, J John chapter 17 and uh, verse 10. I re now I'm remembering Sunday morning there's a typo here and I can't remember what it was. Uh, I'm, I, I, I don't know if it was John 17 or... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it is verse 20 through 26. Yep, John 17. This is Jesus praying for us, for all believers. Um, there, uh, just having left the upper room and on his way to the Mount of Olives and amazing what those last several 
24 hours of Jesus' life after the betrayal and the arrest. But right prior to that, Jesus says these words in prayer, and he's praying for you and me. My prayer is not for them alone. The disciples who are hearing his voice say the words as he prays for them. Could you imagine that? He hears them praying for us. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Think about the implications of that. Mm. He, again, then the world will know that you have sent them and have loved them, even as you have loved me. And so I have a couple friends who often speak in church when they're speaking to the congregation. They'll say beloved or beloved of God. Totally true, because that's what Jesus is saying right here, that, that we are loved by God with a love that God loved his son the intensity and reality of that love. And then he goes on to say, Father, I want those that you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Love is very important. (laughs) Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know you and that they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Again, so Jesus is reiterating that the love that the Father has for him is the love that the Father has for you and me. Yes, you and me. And he wants us to to know that love so that we can show that love, give that love, share that love. Teach, Teach me how to love the way that you do, God. Help me show your heart and your love to your children and to people everywhere. Again, you can't give what you don't have and you can't uh, share what you don't know. And so certainly here at the end of John 17, as Jesus is praying for all the believers who've come, the millions and millions now since, uh, since that day and, and the first of a few disciples, at that time there were just 11 hearing that prayer. Judas was gone. But... Uh, Pretty beautiful to understand, to begin to understand the the breadth and the depth of that kind of love. And again, these passages, Psalm 98, verses 2 and 3, John 3, 16, John 17, 20 through 26, they, they are expressions of the culmination of love's ultimate victory because... And again, I remember Sunday we said this, so I might be weird with you watching this, but I'm going to do it as though we're together right now in real time. Somehow or another, we will be. Uh, but, But I want you to say this with me. Love never fails. Say that with me. Love never fails. One more time. Go ahead, right where you are. Just say it out loud. Love never fails. Let that envelop you let that redirect you however need be as you face situations and and you deal with people where there's a love deficit just bring love god's love you already bring god's love with you if you're his child based on what we just read in john 17 20 through 26 god's love jesus prayed that it would be in us that we would know him he would be in us by his spirit god's love would be in us that we would walk and talk in that awareness and live in that awareness Much easier said than done. Much easier for me to say and for you to hear than to actually live it. It's contested left and right by the world, the flesh, and the devil. But uh, it's this kind of love, again, that never fails, no matter what, that we get to to celebrate. So here's the making it real questions. Uh, The first point, when it comes to love, it is the greatest of the three that remain. The question is, how real is this to and through you, God's love? I I hope that faith and hope are a huge part of your awareness of, of God's presence in your life and how he's not just called us to live but invites us to live and empowers us to live by his spirit with faith and hope. But to, but to really comprehend that the greatest of those three, of these three, is that it's his love. 
his love that we just heard in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, that love that never fails. And then the second making it real question, when it comes to love, it never fails. The, that, this question is, how, how have you experienced this truth in your life? What, where are some of those moments in your life where you realize the, the reason this happened, the reason I got through, the reason there, this change took place is because love never fails. And again, I'm walking it, I'm talking it by God's grace. I want to know it and show it, to live it and give it, and however else you might want to say it. But if it's real, it's there, and it's meant to be fully displayed through the lives that you and I live and through the words that you and I say. And then the action step is this. Be sure that you've memorized 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And having memorized that, keep rehearsing it in your mind and your heart this coming week, uh, knowing, uh, this coming week, keep rehearsing this truth, that faith, hope, and love remain, and that the greatest is love. Um, I don't think 1 Corinthians 13, 13, 13 can ever drill down too deep inside of our hearts and, and our minds to elevate and celebrate the reality of these gifts that God gives us, the gift of faith, the, the gift of hope, and the gift of love. Um, may they be more evident to you and then more prevalent through you and me in the days coming, especially this season of the year. So would you pray with me? Father in heaven, how grateful we are for you and your son Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for guiding us even as we pray now for your glory and, and then for our good. We pray for the celebration that you invite us to experience and to express as your children in your family, in your kingdom forever. Help us to know what real life really is right now. God, we do thank you for the, these three that remain. Strengthen us to live in the light of faith, hope, and love the way you intend for us to do. Again, not just to know about it, but to actually show it in our daily lives. God, as we enter this season, we pray that you'll deliver us from just the trappings of the season of Christmas. Uh, help us be, be delivered from anything that would deflect us or redirect us from the Christ of Christmas. And help us to sing and say in fresh ways, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. We lift the ones that are faltering today, God, as they seek to rest in the knowledge that you will lift them up on eagles' wings as they wait upon you. Remind them of your grace. A lot of my friends and the one praying right now have known some real difficult moments lately. So God, we thank you that when, whenever we falter, you never fail. And give us the grace to let you lift us up again and again and again and again. And as always, God, we pray this in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Today's benediction is simply this, very much connected to this series and this message. Go now to live in the light of faith, hope, and love, today and always. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. Lord willing, see you this Sunday and this coming week. Have a great day.